Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world this is Grant Cameron. And I wanna welcome you to another uh, edition of Consciousness UFO Consciousness, Paranormal UFO Consciousness podcast, and also my YouTube channel, which is White House UFO. Um, I've always said that if you wanna know the paranormal, you gotta to talk to people who've actually had experiences with this. Everybody knows I'm into the UFO thing, but I'm also into um, psychedelics, near-death experiences, and out-of-body experiences. And today I have uh, Jacob Cooper, who is the author of Life After Breath, which is a powerful book about near-death experiences. And I am extremely interested. There's millions of people who have seen this. A lot of uh, scientists still leave, live in the world of naive realism, where they believe only what you see is what is real. Uh, they don't. Uh, they just basically take uh, any a sort of paranormal experiences anecdotal. It really doesn't count. They forget that everything that they experience goes through their mind and comes out their mouth, which makes it anecdotal, just makes it their personal experience. So I want to welcome Jacob to the to the show this morning and thank you for showing up. And sorry about missing last week. We had a little bit of miscommunication on my side, but I'm glad to have you on and I'm glad to hear about your book. So let me ask you first about the book. Um, did you feel compelled to write this? I mean, was this something that sort of somebody was nudging you or something that, that made you write this book and or go through the story of of how the book came to be yeah thank you so much and no need to apologize timing i do believe is everything and it was go. meant to be that we're here and now there you go uh, to, to clarify um the book is about my own near-death experience yeah. um but um it also includes as you mentioned a popular topic that people are interested in my own out of body experience subsequently that i happened you know almost two decades later wow uh, but what you know almost nudged me was when i first became public with my near death experience i spoke at i live in new york in long island and i spoke at one of the most respected long island you know paranormal metaphysical organizations and after speaking uh, someone just came up to me and said, okay, where's your book? And I'm just like, geez, <laughs> it's my first ever presentation, but that's a New Yorker for you. We want to hear, we want it now. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's yeah. just the way things are. And there's, there's, a, uh, you know, there, there's something to that to a degree, but um, I, I'm probably one of the more unlikely candidates to write a book with my own trajectory in yeah. a sense that, um, you know, growing up, I, was in the lowest possible level of remedial courses wow. in community college for reading, for writing. Yeah. High school, I once wrote an essay to get into a to to a particular high school, and the principal scoffed at my writing and laughed and said, "You're not material. You're not this." Wow. You know. So, if I were to follow all of those uh, doubts, I would be nowhere. But doubt serves no purpose. You know, it really doesn't. It doesn't doesn't do anyone any good. Um, but I think I wrote the book for, it's just as a way to give back to so many people that believed in myself and were kind of what I call, you know, angels in human form. Wow. So it was, I mean, my name's on the book, but I don't really see it that way. I see it as accumulation of all the people that helped me get through so many areas in my life and just gratitude to them. So it's a homage to, my writing is homage for all the people who could have had books, but maybe you know, held themselves back or didn't need to, um, yeah. in a way. Yeah, I, I have some people that I do the same thing to where they tell their story and I say, well, you need to do a book. And they say, well, I don't write or whatever. And then I get them going. And um, it's almost like once you 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 get the, the book written and, and then they change and they become more, more outgoing, almost like uh, Messiah, like about their views. And they, they want to tell everybody what happened and they, they become very open because a lot of people... Not not so much now. I remember back in the 1970s, I actually did a um, a study uh, in one of my courses on uh, death and dying at the university. What, I went to the hospitals, and what I did there is I asked the questions. I mean, do you have any weird things happening? And so that was the first near death experience book came out in 1975. This was shortly after that, or maybe the same time. And um, I was asking them, do you ever have people predict when they're going to die? Do you have any miracles? Get up, people walk up, uh, and do anybody have near death experiences? And I remember the one they said, well, you go talk to this guy. Uh, he's had 11 
heart attacks and they wouldn't tell me what happened, but I never did talk to the guy. But at that point, I realized that inside the medical community, they see this stuff, but it doesn't really get public. But today it is very public. Most people know what a near death experience is. Most people know what an out of body experience. They may not believe it, but at least they are, their, their consciousness is to the point where they realize this is going on. So your book is uh, Life After Breath and it's available where on, on Amazon? Yeah, Amazon is a primary source, but I have a lot of um, workshops and book signings. So, you know, people in the tri-state oh. area and I do travel, you know, could, you know, follow my website for other out-of-state or local events. Uh, but writing is something that I believe everyone can do. Yeah. Um, there's a quote in the beginning of my book by Dr. Wayne Dyer. And I think the oh. quote is, you know, you just... I, I stretch it with the book, but, you know, everyone has a song in them. You just don't want to die at the music, you know, yeah. still in you. You want to play it. And I think everyone has an article in them, a book in them, a blog in them, especially in today's day and age. But it's funny that you mentioned, um, you know, your work, you know, I guess you mentioned like in hospice or st yeah. stuff like yeah. that, because, I, you know, I work with my own clients who some of them, you know, are, are close to termina terminality or terminal yeah. and, Universally, the number one regret or number two regret that people have is that they lived a life to satisfy, satisfy someone else or they were afraid of what other people would think uh, by pursuing their dreams. And I think we have to view life and learn from near-death experiencers and people who have had higher consciousness to kind of live how you would live if you're looking from there to here, yeah. you know, from that side of the veil to here, what would you do differently? Yeah. And Probably it's less doubt and more so going for it. Uh, yeah. There's going to be the detractors. It's going to be those, but it's got nothing to do with you and everything to do with their level of perception and their level of consciousness, you know, and uh, the, the right people will look up at your work and not down at it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. What What's your website? Can you name your website? And, and what do you do besides um, this book? Do you, do, you, you mentioned you have clients, so can you sort of, advertise that a bit and what your website is yeah my website is jacoblcooper.com that's jacoblcooper.com currently have a website there i'm going to be renovating it the next couple of weeks it's going to have a different look um i do have a second book coming out wow. uh, it looks like in december with the same publisher waterside publishing company um, and it's called the wisdom of jacob's ladder wow. and this is a very um, to give a sneak preview, it's a very rich book on some of the lessons from my NDE and subsequent life and spiritual transformative experiences, you know, so that people don't have to wait till they die, you know, or I don't believe in the word die, but the body goes to yeah. kind of understand some of these things, they could have it. And I think that um, within my website, I provide you know, services such as mindfulness, hypnotherapy, including past life regression, uh, wow. psychotherapy. You know, I coach people who want to write, you know, are kind of stuck in the way, or I do some consciousness consulting for big questions and we explore some big answers. Uh, as, as I do believe there's a spiritual solution to every problem, you know, wow. out there. Uh, so, you know, you've got a brain, you've got a body, I try to work with you as well as I do remote and in office Reiki session, uh, which Reiki is, you know, comes from the word Ray is universal life force and key is energy. It was really developed by Dr. Mikao Sui uh, in his awakening in Mount Koryama in Japan. Uh, so it's a great form of energy work and energy healing. Uh, but the goal is for people to really learn how to use it themselves and be self-sufficient um, with their own Reiki in their life. So um, I'm inspired to help people from the ground up. I think we have a house and there's many different layers of it and can't ignore one layer of the house, you know. <laughs> so, so I assume it's an obvious question, but the, the near-death experience inspired you to go this sort of spiritual route uh, where if you had not had it, you probably would have lived a life like everybody else, correct? Yeah, you know, I grew up in, you know, a nice middle-class home, you know, educated. It was, you know, both parents were hardworking, you know, one out of four, but out of the four kids, I was by far the biggest outlier, you know, having this <laughs> near-death experience as a kid and by far the most difficult child. So for everyone who thinks that, you know, every time you have these near-death experiences, these angelic beings, sometimes you know, that might, I can't speak for everyone, but at least for me, it made life a double-edged sword. It was a complicated upbringing because I had it at such a young age. 
Um, and so there was an immense amount of complexions, uh, complications and uh, difficulty that I had early on. But later on, I, I'm grateful for that experience once I was able to really integrate it, you know, and take ownership of it. But uh, early on, it, you know, everyone was just kind of on this conveyor belt and I was pulled from it and I was kind of like stretched from the rubber band and then pulled back into it. And I just always felt different than everyone around me. And that's not a bad thing, but it, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Wow. Well said. So let's go through your near-death experience. You said you had it very young. Can you go through the near-death experience and, and what happened? Absolutely. I was three years old. So again, probably a lot different than, you know, a lot of end of years. But um, I do believe, did you have Dr. Ingrid Hunkel? I can't yeah. pronounce it. So yeah, doctor, I yeah. met her. Um, so I know she also had a near-death experience around the same, same age as yeah. myself. Yeah. Yeah. At three years old. So you, this, you've, you've met with her and talked to her? I've met her at an IONS conference before. You know, okay. We took a picture together and she's just a wonderful being of light. And she's a lightning rod of inspiration. Wow. But you, uh, you said that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. She's yeah. dynamic. Um, uh, so, but uh, yeah, you know, her and another colleague of mine, Dr. Bernie Siegel also had his at, a, at an infancy age. So, yeah. It's not as common if you're looking through you know, YouTube channels of people having infancy or child yeah. youth experiences. Most of these, such as, you know, Dr. Eben Alexander, Anita Moore Johnny, they're like middle age, yeah. you know, yeah. conventionalized and this happened and everything changes. Um, but I, I had mine a, as an infant as a result of pertussis, otherwise known as whooping cough. Right. And I went to a playground at the age of three years old, September of 1993. And going into the playground, I was climbing a ladder going up onto a slide. And on top of the slide, you know, at the last rung of the ladder, my breathing just totally stopped. It became, you know, resuscitated. I wasn't able to breathe in anything, which was to this day, the most traumatic, scariest moment of my life. I don't want to sugarcoat that. That was brutal. I was just in this place where I wasn't, my body wasn't working, but I wasn't over there. So it just felt like an eternal period of, um, suffering and it just was really, really scary. Uh, but then moments later, after my body wasn't, you know, working properly, um, I, I exited my body. So it's kind of like if you're in a car and your car is not working, you're not going to just rev up your engine. You're going to get out of the car, pop the hood, see what's going on. Mm -hmm. and so when you're out of your body, there's, there's a higher intelligence, you know, beyond, just this realm, but you're able to really know a lot more about your body and have a lot more awareness of the different functional components. And where they say that we use a very small percentage of our brain. And so in my body, my brain wasn't working. There was just this higher awareness that was present in my subconscious. And I would like to call it a super conscious as well. Um, and, you know, moments later, I just was aware that my body wasn't working, wasn't operating. And then kind of like a power breaker in a home. You just, yeah. you know, everything was shut down. Last part that I remembered was able, was able to look at and feel my own brain. I just saw that it was just slowly being deprived of oxygen. And then slowly as if your soul is a plug and it's pulled into, you know, plugged into a wall, that plug was just yanked. And I just felt my brain literally just power off and just snap in half. It was just like a large, you know, crack. And then that's when, you know, I had a lot of the classic near-death experience, um, you know, you know, a journey where, you know, phenomenon of the tunnel, awareness of, you know, the, a limiting word, but God, you know, what I call Christ consciousness or Christ awareness. You know, I was, I, I was able to encounter my own spirit guides. I encountered, you know, thousands and hundreds of, of angels that were, you know, right in front of me. Um, I was aware of my own soul family that was present, um, even going back to life review of not only this lifetime, but other prior, you know, incarnations that I had. Uh, so it was incredibly profound and full blown. And, uh, you know, the more extent of it is included in life after breath, but um, just so profound. And I want to share, I'm sure you have a thousand questions to ask, but mm -hmm. I want to share one thing that, at, you know, Shortly after my near-death experience, I, I never heard this, but I talked to my father and he said, you know, did you know that after you had your near-death experience, you said, dad, do you remember that day at the playground, you know, when I had to be rushed to the hospital, stuff like that? 
and I, I, I was taken on an ambulance and he's and I said yeah he said you know you um told me that something profound something profound happened but I could only tell you when I'm an adult or that it would rather make sense when I'm an adult you'll understand it one day wow right now you know it's you know it's not going to make sense to you I, I don't remember saying that, but I'll, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> but wow. on the segue, and I'm sure these are some of your follow-up questions, a lot of near-death experiencers go two ways. Either they're they're like shouting at, you know, jumping on top of a desk and telling the world, or it could take you know, almost two to three decades to like have words to it. It doesn't mean that you don't know what happened. It just means that, you know, all of these things are so beyond this realm you know, the colors, the descriptors, everything about it is so beyond the vernacular of any vocabulary, you know, that it's just such a limiting, futile act. And uh, I, I, would, I would contest, I would say that that's true, where, you know, it probably in my later teens, early 20s is when I first started talking about it, but it was always something that I kept very sacred and near and dear to me. Um, but it was just so sacred that I didn't want to tell anyone, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you you mentioned this um, idea that it was um, ineffical. It was you know the colors were more vivid, all this kind of stuff. A lot of people, like skeptics, will stand up and say, "Well, this was an illusion." Was it as real as the real world? Was it more real than the real world? What I would say is this. Um, you know, for people who come from that standpoint or the materialistic, you know, yeah. scientific kind of background, and I'm not a big science guy, but I would say is this, my body, my brain is totally deprived of oxygen. It was, you know, you know, very limited. And so for myself to have all these full blown experiences, how is that possible with the brain in a body that was suffocated? At the very least, you should have very limited degrees of perception so it doesn't make sense and to this day hard material scientists are not able to explain that phenomenon as well as you know when people are let's say about to go and they're having all of this terminal lucidity you know and they're in alzheimer's or dement whatever that is yeah. their brain waves are very slow it's not like all of a sudden they just peak up but all of a sudden you know, the family gets excited and they have all these experiences um, and they hold on to hope of that. And unfortunately, usually a couple of days later after that, you know, period of high awareness, they tend to go. So there's a lot of things that aren't be able to explain by the material scientific standpoint. Um, so I would say this is more real than real. And your death experience studies each and every day is coming through with hard data, you know, to kind of back some of these unexplained phenomenon. I mean, one of them is like the tennis shoe where um, one of my colleagues uh, was having an NDE and she was in a hospital and she was aware of a tennis shoe on top of the hospital roof. And she was just in a random bed in a hospital. Like, how do you explain that? What did she do? Take like, um, I forget what are those things, the, it, like a, like um, an, a droid, or, uh, you know what I'm uh, talking about. The uh, uh, um, drones. Would she take like a drone when she was in her hospital bed and she looked at it or took like a private, you know, Hamptons helicopter or jet yeah. while she was in the hospital, you know, so it's just so many unexplained things. And so, yeah. um, you what, know, what about I, sense of time? Did you have a, a sense of that it no. appeared to be a long time or did, did did all everything sort of happen all at the same time? Can you describe that? Or What I would say is on the other side, there's it's kind of like silence. And if you meditate, you understand this silence you cannot divide once you're in silence you recognize you just can't divide it up you can't chop it up it's just there past present future you're just connected to it um, i think we get caught up in our own division of time through the linear development of our lives and you know being in this you know you know time bound physical life uh, but when you get onto the other side past present future it, you know it's all just one eternal moment and that's not something for our linear minds to be able to understand and i think our degree of understanding comes from the level of our consciousness for coming from the con you know the linearity of consciousness or the linear mind that's what we'll be able to grasp but when we're understanding this from the non-linear mind it will resonate and make more sense so 
Um, but otherwise it could drive the linear mind crazy when you talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's the thing. I mean, that's a, a pr pretty common thing in present sort of metaphysical um, science that that there's only here and now. This idea that you know right. everything's sort of stacked on each other, and it's it's hard for your 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 sort of ego mind to wrap wrap around that idea because it just doesn't make any sense. But a lot you have people all describe this when they come back. This idea of I would go further there than a lot of the descriptions that I hear, which are beautiful encounters that I felt and had a feeling that to describe it, that all was well, is well, will be well when I was there. You know, you see in our lives, we're used to bracing ourselves. As lots as you say, you know, when we're in the past, we have sadness or in the future it promotes, you know, anxiety or worry. Um, and so this to me, uh, and the closest way that we could, you know, have these inner death experiences um, would be to integrate mindfulness in many ways, which to me is just, you know, being here, but not just mindfulness being in the moment, but mindfulness with an openness to wisdom, empathy, compassion, and understanding of life on a deeper level. Uh, but it was just so foreign because in our world, we're used to like bracing ourselves for something or holding on to something. We're just not used to in this moment, all is well, was well, will be well. And that's the feeling that I got beyond this timelessness that I was experiencing. There was no worry. You know, you know, I was aware of my own eternity that I was forever a part of. Fascinating. I actually had an interview that's on my YouTube channel with uh, one was a girl who had a near-death experience, got thrown off a motorcycle. Wow. Another was a girl who does um, uh, regression, who was just uh, in a sort of a bad state, was sitting there and just reading a book. And the third one was a guy who was in a float tank in Los Angeles. And this happened in, in um, this float tank where they got exactly the message you got. And that's another one that people, every, everything is perfect. Almost like John Lennon said, everything, everything is perfect. In the end, everything will be perfect. If it's not perfect, it's not the end. Or if everything will be okay. If it's if in the end, if it's not okay, then it's not the end. This idea, yeah. and that's for people to wrap their head around that whatever is happening is perfect. And yeah, yeah. glad you brought that message up because other people have given me the same message. A colleague of mine, and if you didn't have him on your channel, please look him up. His name is Jeffrey Olson. Okay. Um, he had a profound near-death experience, um, you know, in which, well, I don't want, I'll, you know, he's, yeah. he's great, but he made a post that said something along the lines that I may not know where the journey is going, but I know the ending. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty profound. And that's enough, right? Yeah. And that's exciting to have this not knowing. We always want to know, right? You know, everything. But, you know, what's the point of living if we know every little thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. What's the point of writing a test if we give you the answers? <laughs> yeah, and that's the point of it. Um, I, I recently watched a profound movie that I never saw coming. You know, for years, yeah. a lot of people were telling me about this Pixar movie called Soul. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um. And then I had a colleague by the name of Christopher Allen, who's been on the Maury show. He's a you know world renowned medium, and he's we're doing an event together next week, sold out event. And he said, "Got to watch this movie." I'm telling you, he's like pounding the table, and I watched it. So profound. I don't want to give the movie away, yeah. But it kind of speaks to like how we're chasing this apex in life, you know, the top of the mountain, thinking that that bronze ring will get us all that we want. But really, and it's deeply spiritual, metaphysical, but really it's that's it's the small things that are the big things. And it's living while we live, you know, that's that's really where you could draw the more spirituality out of life expressing life itself, you know. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty profound. And I always look at the behind the scenes, and I did find out there was two Ions people that were advisors on that movie. Because you look at it and you go, like, where did they get I, this? I, this, I, is, this is that real. Makes sense. They had to have got this from somebody. And that's the thing is the consciousness is rising through books like yours, documentaries, where people will watch it as an entertainment and they're in, in they're being subliminally sort of trained that this is how it works. It's just the a yeah. new idea being imposed. That makes complete sense. I mean, because I was I just watched this like a week ago and I'm like, they had to consult with someone on this. There's no <laughs> way, did. you know, that these corporate Pixar people are coming. And this is they have to speak with someone on this stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it, I mean, I haven't seen a Pixar movie since like 2001 with Monsters, Inc. or Toy Story in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. So 
this came a long way. And then I found out that Pixar has these other, you know, deeply allegorical and symbolic, you know, met movies such as Up and um, Inside Out. You know, it's just, it's it's a changed world. You know, yeah. I think people are tired of just stories. Sometimes they want meaning. They want, you know, substance. Yeah. You know, I think people are striving for that. And that was an impetus for the wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Because I really feel that inspiration and wisdom is the oxygen of our times. We, wow. we need it wow. to Good. survive I'll, and to I'll thrive. I'm use that quote. That's good. That's a good one. <laughs> um, and I don't take credit for it. I give my quotes to the universe. So, yeah. but but to the writing piece, like I I think when you come from a degree of limitations, you'll see more limitations. But you yeah. surrender to your true nature as an eternal, unlimited being. You're going to find that your life is unlimited, and so when I write, I don't plan there whatever i go and f i go for a run you know i meditate for a bit just to get myself up to to that higher vibratory state but then after that i just get into that relaxed state and allow my fingers to go over the keyboard and you know the universe just takes over my book so my books you just have the universe i don't want my name on those anymore <laughs> i want to get to that point where you just say universe i'll take the royalties but you know <laughs> yeah yeah well it's true it's almost like i don't know if you know the story but Deepak Chopra talks about this. He's written 90 some books and Crazy. he talks about how he writes the book. So he, he gets an idea that he wants to uh, work on before he goes to bed and he thinks about it and thinks about it. And then he wakes up in the morning. The first thing he does in the morning is just lie in bed and stare at the ceiling and just stare at the ceiling. And right. whatever comes in his head in the first 30 minutes is what he writes for his blog on that day. And that's where the 90 books come from. That's why he wrote them. <laughs> that's pretty he's, he's amazing. And I think someone who... I guess, you know, they, they were contemporaries, but I, I think Deepak was influenced a bit too by Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, and Wayne would recommend waking at what's called the hour of the wolf or 3 a.m. Yeah. And getting your writing going in. He had this movie called The Shift and you would kind of see his library and he had like Carl Jung everywhere and this he had this whole room just dedicated, you know, to his writing. He had affirmations everywhere. So I wouldn't recommend 3 a.m. That's for the average person, that's that's a lot. But there is a power where you're, you know, kind of in this between state during that time, you know, very receptive to higher, you know, information and channeled work. Yeah. So beautiful. I mean, you just sound almost like you're able to change the channel, just to change the vibration or or go to another channel and, and tap yeah. into it. So it's all there, as you point out, it's all there. It's just a matter of accessing it. How do you access it? Hmm. That's that's a great gift, but I think it's the power and surrender. Yeah. And this is a chapter, you know, I don't want to give away my next book, but this is a big component of my current book. And even more so my next book is the power of surrender. Wow. And That's surrender you know, is, is very big in mental health and recovery and working in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you think of the serenity prayer and all that kind. But um, surrender is why I'm here today. You know, you see, I was holding on to eternal suffocation in my near-death experience. And the moment that I let go of my suffocated breath and surrendered to the breath of eternity was when I was able to cross over and, you know, be, be okay. So really, there's the breath of our body, but then there's this breath of eternity that that is our soul. And that will propel us through any given time, connecting to our soul, connecting to that particular breath of eternity and surrendering to that and letting go of pain and all this other stuff. Beautiful. I I wrote, I wrote a book on, I did an experiment with um, psilocybin. I'd never done any of that in my life, but I decided I wanted to sort of see what this was all about. So I did 25 sessions and I wrote mm -hmm. a book called The Psilocybin School, which was the first 15 sessions. And in the front, I have the first cover, inside the cover, I have the entire page, one expression, which says, surrender is the rule. Believe me, surrender is the only rule. That was the number <laughs> one message I learned in there, is you have, you have got to surrender, because if you don't surrender, it's going to be a rough trip, man. It's just, you're going, you're going places you don't want to go. And that's, uh, so I'm glad you, you had the same thing, that that was a, a key message. And that is for people. People maybe not understand it, but surrender is, is the rule. I mean, that is the key to, um, to this whole thing, I think. But that's so antithetical to how we are brought up. We're brought up that strength is holding on and being stoic. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're not taught that strength is in letting go. Yeah. 
But I say when you let go, your consciousness grows. You know, it expands. You know, that to me, the you know, the you know, the physical realm and the spiritual realm are sometimes incongruent where spirituality is really about letting go in this realm. It's like to get anywhere you have to like attain and grow and hold mm -hmm. on to stuff. But you know, when we want to expand, it's just a matter of letting go of all those barriers, yeah. you know, to expansion. Oh, wow. So you mentioned that you you ran into let's go through two you ran into the spirit guide so I mean can you describe um, did they talk to you did they interact with you how did you know they were your, your spirit guides and describe a little bit about that part of the story yes um, it was telepathic communication it was like deeper you know than you and I talking by telepathy there's no facade we could say words but there's might be energy behind those words and telepathy yeah. you can't fool it you know it's transparency whatever it's going through you is sent off there's no articulation of it it's just pure and raw uh but my spirit guides were a male and female guide you know and when i saw them instantaneously i knew exactly who they were and it was the most euphoric experience just being re reunited with them well, at the same time, I had to, I had a lot of degree of embarrassment, not from their end, but from my end, that I forgot all this time, all of these celestial beings and all of this connection was around me this whole time on earth. And sometimes I just, in my life, even at three years old, I forgot that or blocked that out the majority of my time. And so to think that we're these isolated agents just living this life on earth and not connected to something else is a complete farce it's so far from the truth that there is so much love inside of us and around us that we can never begin to imagine how powerful that is but my spirit guides were there and the way that i felt was it's just the closest thing to my soul was my spirit guides it's almost kind of like an extension of myself but imagine like the most popular best looking guy or girl whatever you're into and like someone that you just are in awe of, like a celebrity, and they're your guide, you know, they're with you, they chose you. That's kind of how it felt. I'm like me, but like, I, I was just such in such awe, you know, of them. It's like, just imagine like Marilyn Monroe was like with, you know, it's just like, yeah. without the, you know, without the, the drugs and the, but you know what yeah. I'm saying? It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how it kind of felt, but it felt like an undeniable connection. But at the same time, it was like, I was just like, wow like i was just in awe that i was connected to them and i think we have that but it, it was just so profound it was just a degree of understanding of every single thing about myself on a, on a much higher level but the way that the the guides that that i see the guides is the way that they see us you know they look at us you know with that i think sometimes we take on these human identities and different ages and stages of our life and that's our identity but beyond that you know, we're, we are divine spiritual beings having this human experience. And we we are so much more than what we could ever imagine in terms of, you know, some of the limiting belief systems that we hold on to our own egos and our own limited constructs of ourselves. And so when you're over there, you really are able to see who you truly are, which is so much more than, you know, a lot of people see themselves here. That, that's always like to me is always the key remember who you actually are you're not the actor on the stage you're playing an actor on the stage big difference. right <laughs> and so and exactly. you, you mentioned love talk a little bit about love people will describe this unconditional love is that what you would describe as when you were there absolutely i grew up in a pretty religious jewish background and not to bash religion i believe when it's done the right way, it could be a beautiful thing for for some people. And there's different levels of soul development. For some, it's it's a it's a great and grounding communal practice. But I think without the utilization of a spiritual practice, in addition to it, you know, it has its flaws. And throughout history, you know, we could understand that. Uh, but in religion, it's you know the way that I grew up is almost kind of like quid pro quo not quid pro quo but like whatever you did was uh kind of judged it's kind of like almost like this the domineering authoritative parent that you just just got tired of and had some disdain for the depiction yeah, i get the terms right but god and man's image or man's and god's image that kind of thing 
But over there, it was, you know, God, the way that I could describe it as the highest apex of our infinite reality as we know it, the centerpiece of, of where all things flow from, which the DNA of that is unconditional love. Um, I mentioned Wayne Dyer, and he's someone who uh, deeply inspires my work for many different reasons. And I could get into some of those if we have time or for maybe another segment. But Wayne would always say, and he would give a workshop, if you take an orange, you squeeze an orange out, you get orange juice. If you take yourself and you squeeze yourself out, what's left is pure unconditional love. And that's the DNA of all of us. And so hopefully we don't have to wait till we cross over to remember that we could see that and embody that. Okay, now let me ask you a question related to what we see around us. We see total division. We see, you know, people lock and load. We're going to, you know, we're going to start killing people. And you see this absolute division. What what did you learn from the other side, from, from what you've, you've experienced that would solve that problem? It's a wonderful question, Grant, because <laughs> we live in a changing world each and every day where there's some new thing going on, you know. But back to that movie, A Soul, remember, like the character was kind of like a lost soul, right? And then eventually it remembered and kind of found who it was. And so we live in a world of polarity. When we could be found, we could also, you know, be lost. We can't be permanently lost. Like we said on the journey, sometimes we take different journeys, but at the end, you know, all things eventually come back to the source, to its light. You know, darkness has a shelf life, I believe too. Uh, but I think a lot of it is, it's not a one size fit all type answers, you know, for people in darkness or going down that route. Um, it could be comorbid reasoning. And it's hard to say one particular, but I think at the core of it is is a forgetfulness. You know, people yeah. really forget who they truly are. And if you remember who you are, you can remember who we are. Yeah. And I think if you're holding on to this damaged sense of self, there's a lot of sabotage that comes with it. In a sense, you know, Albert Einstein would say the most important question that we have is the universe or life ambivalent. Is it a positive, loving place or is it a hateful and cruel place? So I think sadly, a lot of people have had the world that we live in create their mind instead of their beautiful minds creating the world. And that's, I think, what's happening. And we have to have a paradox of this to make the change. It all starts with a simple shift. So Wayne would say the moment we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And sadly, a lot of people are tuning into the wrong you know, degrees of information and that's polluting their minds in the world that we're living in. Yeah. It's uh, I have an Israeli friend who's a, an experiencer who wrote a book called one, the idea that we're all one. And that's that I think that's what you forget is that, you know, that this is where if you knew your connection to these people, you'd realize this idea that everything is, is, is perfect. And that um, we're, we're all connected and it's like, shooting yourself in the in the hand or or the foot if you do this kind of stuff that idea yeah okay, well said and so that was a, what kind of messages did they did you get all the teachings during your near-death experience can you describe what you got during your near-death near experience that you realized in terms of spiritual understanding and what you got later on through jogging and meditation and and quieting the mind thing did you learn a lot there or did you learn a lot after that? Were, have they been giving you stuff? Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Well, what happened was what happened. I couldn't change the series of events. Um, but, you know, as I went on, you know, there was more understanding and more meaning in the world that we're living in. So an inner basis, it was always there, but able to like use it and integrate it in this world, you know, change as my language expanded, as, as my brain developed. So the ability to ground this experience evolved as, you know, I got adapted, you know, it's kind of like getting a new guitar and the guitar players getting used to that guitar and stuff like that. And so, you know, the soul gets used to the instrument, the body, you know, as time goes on, you're able to perfect your sound. 
the time goes on. And that, that took that, you know, in each and every day in each interview that I do is another way to learn how to find different meaning and understanding. But I learn most from uh, my clients and people in my workshops, you know, that's really where I learn a lot of this stuff. Uh, Cause what I say is I'm, I'm a dude and most guys, like we think like kind of one way the world could be imploding, but we have our blinders on. And so when you're asked a lot of these difficult questions that I get from people or my clients, it motivates myself to just dig in deeper and to look at this in another way. And to be honest with the uh, experience, as well as where people are at and to learn how to perfect the message in a way that's understandable, you know, cause if you're up here and people are down there, it's not going to, it's not going to stick as much. You have to be cognizant of where people, where people's feet are at. Um, but you know, I would say people want these near death experiences. You know, they they feel um, in a way that that a lot of end of years come from a place of privilege, and I I understand that. Uh, but at the same time, they they just don't know the amount of complexity that it has led and difficulty, you know, that we've had, you know, for this experience. But I would also say is you don't have to have something, you know, traumatic happen to your body to have awareness that can happen. You know, but awareness could be present with trauma without it. And I think the easiest way is to find ways to get quiet. And like you said before, when you get quiet, you know, these people are having this, you know, different paths up to the mountain, but similar degrees of understanding. You know. Wow. Wow. You mentioned um, seeing your soul family. Have you read Michael Newton? And can you describe the soul family experience that you you encountered? I am very familiar uh, with... Uh, Michael Newton, the luminary that he is. And yeah. I love people like, you know, Michael Newton and Brian Weiss. They're kind of similar in a way where they just, you know, I think they're both, Brian was a clinical psychiatrist. I think Michael might have also been a psychologist, yeah. but they both kind of came from this left brain, you know, materialistic yeah. kind, of, you know, uh, kind of place. And then they were just blown away, you know, by some of their client sessions and that got them on a quest to understand this stuff where this was just undeniable, the evidence of it. Uh, but I am familiar with the journey of souls, the destiny of souls. I've read, you know, the journey of souls before great book, you know, and, and for those viewers who are listening to it, that's really about the life in between life, you know, correct me if I'm wrong kind yeah. of thing yeah, sure. it does, you know, delve into some of the other stuff, but it's like life on the other side and what people have which I do utilize in my past life regressions too, in addition to other different lifetimes. But I, I was able to really connect to um, soul family members, which, you know, like we said, we play different roles on the stage of life, different genders, different cultures and stuff like that. But there's a group that we are a part of. But what I would say is to not get uh, lost with the farce and the trees thing that, you know, the biggest soul family is a family that we're all a part of, you know, you know, and so that is, but I think at the core, you know, each of us has, you know, that nuclear core that we go into lifetime in lifetime out. And, you know, there's, there's a tremendous phenomenon to it. I personally, my own biggest skeptic. And so still having this near death experience, I, I just later in life needed like hard evidence to kind of vi validate the soul family phenomenon and so I had an aunt who was having terminal lucidity um, at the end of her life. And she was uh, one of my spiritual mentors, um, you know, my later teens and early 20s. And as she was going, she left me with one last message. And I say this in many of my interviews, but now that we're bringing up the subject matter, you know, she said, if you look at a family photo, you know, each particular member might have different physical characteristics. But if you're looking at the eyes, which is the window of the soul, you know, there's something that ties the family together, not all members, but, you know, more times than not, that's very deep. At the time, I was like, that's a cool message. You know, thank you. That's how she left. But then she came through with evidential, through evidential mediumship in a reading. And the medium said, I'm connecting to your aunt. And she's keep on, I don't know why, but she's keep on telling me the word picture. Why is she telling me the word picture? And I just knew that was the validation of the emphasis of the teaching of soul family, a soul family member coming through with their own teaching and validation of it, that it is real, that it is true. How, well, how many, when you saw the soul family, how many people were a part of this? Was it like a 
20 or like Newton describes, like some people only have three left because the people have moved on. Can you describe that? And did you realize the relationship they were to you in your present life? So like like 10 to 15, you know, yeah. members and a couple stood out where like I looked at family photos and people that I didn't know. And I was able to know as like a younger kid who they were. So there was still some recollection of of, of some of them. But beyond that, wasn't just like, let's say, biological. So yeah. family went beyond biological. Um, I was able to be drawn to my most recent past life. And I use the term past for convenience, yeah. but really, yeah. Yeah, we know how that is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Time. Uh, but I was able to connect to different students that I had in that last lifetime. And I felt an undeniable connection to those students. But I also saw, you know, that I... Um, you know, I chose, you know, to to cross over through suicide in that lifetime. And this has been, you know, picked up by different intuitives prior to me becoming public in the same exact situation that I saw exactly what happened. But I just felt an incredible connection to those soul fan members, too, that I was connected to. And they, you know, were with me. So I was, I became emotional, too. I remember my near-death experience. Not too many people talk about it, but it is... It is very deep and emotional, and there is a, an adjustment period when you go over to the other side. It's not like you just you're there. It, you know, it's yeah. it's beautiful and profound, but there's a you know there's an acclimation period. You know, there has to be. So, Did, in your last one, you talk about students. Have you, is this a progression of of lives where you're you're carrying on what you did in your last lifetime, and that goes to almost any experience of whatever it is? I I ask people, uh, do you think you have a soul contract? Are you on a mission? Without question, as a kid, I used to have all these dreams of myself leaving this mountain with beings of light around me, wow. you know, charting my life. And I was like, what, why am I keep on seeing this dream? See, as a kid, like uh, I would have all these past life memories and premonitions and it would be annoying. Like to me, I just wanted to like put down the beach ball and live a life, but the beach ball just kept on coming up to the surface. And it was an it was a non refundable gift that I had after having this near death experience. Uh, it just opened up a doorway of awareness. But absolutely, our life is charted. There's a greater intelligence that's that's with us around us, you know, in charting our lives before we get here. Now, obviously, destiny, free will is a whole other segment, but there's free will always. Uh, but but yes, absolutely. And regarding to that last lifetime, undeniably so. Um, in that last lifetime in which I chose to complete suicide. I don't say commit because that is offends a lot of people who have lost family members. It's, it equates it to committing a crime. I don't view it that way. It's a choice. And for some that, you know, we just can't pass judgment. We just don't yeah, know what yeah. the, you have to really, but I, I just remember just being trapped in, in a situation and I just saw no avail, no hope. And it was just pure suffocation and, so that happened and I just chose that. And then after that, I just was, you know, completely surrendered by love and there was no judgment, you know, and there was pure understanding that that situation would come and pass. And I, I felt my own degree of awareness from that. So the near-death experience is very much allegorical for that, you know, situation. In a sense, that messages are repeated to those greater lessons are embraced and so for me, that greater message was trusting in what's inside of me and all around me versus the darkness or challenges in front of me, that light prevails over darkness. And that's a message not only for myself, but for readers and viewers of my work. You know, that we've all been there with our back against the wall. We have to trust that there's something greater inside of us that could prevail us, you know, through this paralysis. And I experienced that literally when I suffocated and had nothing there that Despite that, you know, we're eternal beings. We go on. We could persevere even past physical death. Now, you, you brought up the sort of the duality thing. How do you um, talk to people about good versus evil and deal with the idea of the bad near-death experience? What, what do you think is going on there? You're talking about the distri like the distressing NDEs yeah, yeah. and stuff? Yeah. You know, I used to run groups for for spiritual transformative experience and to ease and not always but time to time those would be there and a lot of people just felt so disvalidated 
for what they had and so isolated because we live in a Disney world. Let's face it. Everyone wants to not, well, you look at the news, but no, but I mean, a lot of people like sensationalism. They like, you know, this, this kind of euphoric experiences. It takes them out of their own suffering. So we have enough of that projected, you know, in the news cycles. So a lot of people feel this validation for, for people who might've had these experiences. I would say it's important to not disvalidate what you had to make sense of it. But if you're asking me, when you enter the light, you know, that's not distressing, you know, once you cross over. So I think some people, they might not have fully crossed with distressing your death experiences. Because once you're in the light, you know, the before part is distressing. You know, I certainly had, could attest to that. But once you cross over, you know, the light is the light, you yeah. know. So that's that's what I would say. But I would say the important thing is to not knock your experience, to not judge yourself, to feel empowered you know, and to find someone to maybe process the experience or talk with it, it's a great deal of value, you know, and, and, and trauma, but surviving what you did and still being able to live the tale is, should be cathartic and euphoric too, you know, that you've progressed to move on from, from that dark period. Yeah. Well, one of the, the, the explanations that somebody had brought up, but how do you prove this? I mean, I mean unless they do maybe a, a study on people who've had these distressing things, is this idea that they won't let go. And that's right. this idea of surrender that when you're, you, you, same thing happens in psychedelics. That's why I said in psychedelics, I know that, that you have to surrender. If you don't surrender, you're going to have an, an, a real ugly near death experience. Bad, a bad trip. You're hanging yeah. on, you won't, you won't let go. But once you surrender, like I would be in a situation where it would be uh, as deep a hell as you could possibly explain. And then you'd say, okay, I chose this. I chose to do this. Uh, I, okay, this is the way it's going to be for an eternity because it made it feel like this is going to be an eternity. And I said, okay, that's it. I, I chose it and boom, it was gone. And I was suddenly I was in the light. It was that kind of thing where, so maybe the near death experience, and I guess there'll be more studies done of it. Uh, you're on the leading edge where I think you, I don't know how many books there are in near death experiences. Maybe you know, but it's got to be thousands of books on near death experiences and, and millions of people who are now starting to tell their stories where we can start to do studies and find these uh, explanations for for why people would have these experiences. It's changed so much, you know, yeah. back, you know, and it would be hard to have a talk about NDEs without mentioning the man who coined the term, Dr. Raymond Moody, yeah. uh, who's on the cover of my book and is a friend of mine. Yeah. I have so much um, respect and gratitude for his work. Because I walked around like many people having this experience, and I didn't say this is a near-death experience. So yeah. if you're able, able to have that lexicon or that diagnosis, it could be it could be very helpful, much like in mental health or, or stuff like that. But the but I guess also with that is to not just be defined by by that you know yeah. diagnosis, much like clients that I see with major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety, whatever that is, that's a part of you, but it's not the full totality of you. And yeah. so we have these subdivisions of transformative experiences and we get very technical with them, but to me, they're all one and the same. <laughs> you know, I don't, I can't, you know, they're all to me, like just different paths up the mountain, but kind of similar endings. And I think some people, they just need to shake up in their lives to kind of wake them up, you know, in a way. You mentioned that uh, your clients teach you stuff. Can you sort of describe maybe one sort of moment where you went, well, wow. I mean, whether it was uh, somebody talking about a uh, past life or some sort of thing where you were sort of blown away by what somebody told you. I think a lot of my clients bring through synchronicities, which is a big thing that I'm getting through, you know, now when they just talk about these crazy synchronicities. I'm actually reading a book by Dr. Gary Schwartz, who's a new oh, friend yeah. of mine, called Super Synchronicity, which is an outstanding book. Uh, you know, for those are, who aren't familiar with Gary, he's, you know, um, he works for the University of Arizona, and he, you know, scientifically throughout decades has, you know, tested mediums such as Suzanne Northup, John Edward, uh, my friend Allison Dubois, stuff like that. But he's just a big pioneer of the science, you know, and research behind some of the paranormal or you know, what I call the normal kind of stuff, uh, paranormal psychology. But um, I think when you're having these synchronicities, it's just how can't you deny, you know, the presence of something? And sometimes we just, you know, think that um, 
events are so isolated, but if you're able to just connect these random events and look at the probabilities of those, you know, unrelated events happening together, you know, how could you not be a believer? So I think hearing a lot of my client's stories of, you know, synchronicities, you know, is something. On the other end, clients come to me and often say, it sounds so easy, but so difficult to do. And I, and, and it's like a big running theme. And, you know, it's, um, I think we've come up with almost kind of like the the things that should be easy are now difficult and vice versa. But by doing these things, it makes your life, you know, so much more uh, seamless and easy. It doesn't change the series of events, but it could change how we engage with those events. And I think the more that we're able to not judge ourselves through the through this process and to be step by step with it. And the more exciting that we are in terms of the journey mode versus the results mode, you know, I think we people could have a lot more shifts, but we live in a world that people just want to see results right here, right now. They're not patient with themselves. And that's incongruent with the practice. Then this is a lifelong practice, you know, of this, of this stuff in our everyday life. So um, I think with my clients, it's kind of learning like, like the real suffering that a lot of people, you know, go through and finding ways for them to kind of pivot, um, you know, day by day. Uh, uh, th there's somebody threw around a figure that 75 to 80 percent of people who had near death experiences end up getting divorced in terms of trying to relate to people after you've had it. Have you had those kind of experiences where it's very hard to sort of fit in and, uh, you know, relate? And, and it's it's a part of the thing that nobody would you think, oh, well, the, everything is perfect and and it's all going to go great now and don't realize that it's a it's a tough road to to hoe when you're when you've had one of these experiences. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up, I was very kind of to myself. It was very hard for me to fit in. I always felt that way. But I saw that as as rewarding. It's like to me, isn't it more stimulating to generate your own current than to be a leaf in water? I don't know. You know, it's yeah. like <laughs> I, I'm when you see yourself as an eternal soul, you recognize the value and how cool it is to be different. As a kid, that's not the case though. As a kid, you know, cool is fitting in. Uh, but as I get older, it's kind of like the cool thing is to do something different and to be unique. Um, I do believe we have a social component to our brains and we do need that. And so I think the important part is to learn how to balance the human part and the spiritual part. I mean, they're both, you know what I'm saying, though. Uh, if we were meant to just, you know, have this stuff all the time, we wouldn't be here. I think we ascended into matter or descended into matter to really have a life, you know. So I think if anything as I get older, it's enriched how I see things. You know, back in the day, I was just, I would just associate things as being spiritual and those things that weren't were not. And now I just see everything has a possibility to see it as spiritual, even the dark, you know, and especially the dark, that could be the greatest teacher of them all. It's can't see the moon without the darkness of the, of the light, you know, or the stars. So, but I, but I've been able to embrace all things as, as, as being potentially spiritual if you're able to find it. Uh, I think the harder part is learning how to have different gears and having ways to learn how to relate to people. Cause you might be over there and over here and no one's better or worse, you know, but learning how to have that common ground without compromising and losing yourself is, is key. You know? Yeah. It's almost like uh, some, one of the ways I think about it is if you realize you came in here, you plan to do something and you're just setting up your own movie. And unless the movie has ups and downs and excitement, like where the, there's, there's tragedy and the person has to fight their way out of it, people get up and walk out of the movie. If it's just a plain movie, it has to have this up and down thing in order to keep the attention. And it's like we're setting up our own movie and making it sort of exciting. And we got to overcome this. And then we challenge ourselves with that. And, and mm -hmm. so that, that's the thing is remember who you actually are, that people sort of forget and they become victims as to what's going around them. Perfectly well said. And my my new friend, Alison Dubois, who's on the cover endorsement of my book, she was the inspiration behind the hit show Medium. Wow. Um, she's been at Oprah before and stuff like that. But she said in one of her books that, you know, we are their afterlife. Wow. <laughs> we focus on them as their afterlife, but they're focused on us. We're their afterlife technically. So by that, like they're doing things that we in a way can't do and we're doing things that they can't do. Yeah. So we're living through for them and through them. So it's 
in like almost every reading that I that I that I get, it's like my grandfather comes through and uh, you know evidence, but it's like you got to live. <laughs> I get so serious on this mission and finishing all these books and stuff like that, but it's like it's about living. You know, putting your feet in the sand, going on a trip, going to a ball game. You know, we you know the ultimate collateral in this life is time, and we just learning from this near death experience. Sometimes we think that we'll have that five year tip plan 10 year plan and what i really learned is tomorrow is really not guaranteed and, and i'm hoping that's one of the silver linings out of this you know you know pandemic that we're still in is um you know the ability to not put things off is to live while we live that's very is significant yeah. um but yeah it's kind of like we all could like chase and get after like you know the movie deals or book deals and but it's, yeah. It's it's great. It's helpful for other people, but you have to have your own private enjoyment in life too. Yeah, that's that's where the rich spirituality comes from, from yeah. life itself. Yeah, yeah. You you almost get into a spiritual thing, like the movie Soul, except instead of material, you yeah. chase the spiritual stuff, and you don't realize, you know, this other aspect to how how it actually works. Yeah, you know, that movie really tugged at my heartstrings. It really, really did. But um, yeah. we all could get after that. But it's it's just important to be mindful and to do things differently and uh isn't it better to live 100 years in one year 100 times you know yeah, yeah. 100 different years and different experience you know and so you have this blank canvas in front of us of our life and we could fill it in through these different experiences and make such a different portrait and rich portrait you know so many of us have like one line here one line there it's not a full picture you know Wow, you're 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 very inspirational. Let me let me sort of close with this question: Can you describe um, maybe three things that you'd leave people with that sort of are the most important lessons that that to sum this all up as to how to live your life? Yeah, that's right. It live while you live is number one. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are fearful of what happens when we die. They're not as fearful of what what happens that we could die while we live. Yeah, you know, living is a choice. You know, a lot of people are just kind of sleeping at the wheel and not invigorated. So finding ways to figure out what, you know, makes you passionate, what makes you going, what raises your life, you know, and, and you know, not to be embarrassed by your passions. If, for instance, I'm a big, you know, metaphysical guy, but, I, but I'm also a suffering diehard New York Jets fan. I could oh. easily say, oh, it's just football. It's just a game. I'm not going to do it. But no, I embrace that. You know, that's like a big part of me. In fact, I'm going to be going to probably my first Jets games of my life. And they torture me year in and year out. But again, our afterlife is what we do here. We carry over some of those passions. And that's just a part of us. And so to not judge those things, to not feel like we're too old or too cool for those things. That's, you know, that's the inner child work. It's it's embracing yeah. those things. So that's number one. You know, no, no, you know, number two is, yes, you know, remembering that we do not die and we and once you recognize that we don't die, that we can only live. So it's just bearing in mind, you know, to to find life within life itself. And that's sometimes hard, you know. And and I guess the third is to remember who you are, that sometimes we carry through the projections of other people through their how they see themselves in the limitations with how they see us. Mm -hmm. And have you ever noticed that when you've spoken to someone who is very well connected. They will see you in such a different way than a very limited, judgmental, pompous, arrogant kind of person. So I think a lot of people have inherited and been disempowered with their self-identity, with how other people see them. I think it's important to remember that you're so much more than who you are. I said this, you know, in, in a couple of different segments, but I was getting a reading and the person said, it was connecting to my grandfather again. She said, you know, your grandfather is asking why you're doubting yourself. If you're doubting yourself, you're doubting him. If you're doubting him, you're doubting God. Wow. <laughs> so there's no such thing as self-doubt. Self-doubt is doubting God. Yeah. If you do believe that, you know, God is the, as you know, you and God are forever connected. That is who you are. So it's, it's to embrace your true nature, to remember that, and to remember that there's so much love inside of you and around you that you can never truly be alone, even if you try to put the blinders on. Wow. You mean you mentioned sports. I'll, I'll have go an analogy. I'm a big Winnipeg Jet fan. And I often bring up the spiritual aspect of sports. 
is there, we used to tell our kids when they played hockey, there is no I in, in team. And it's this idea that the team that wins the Super Bowl is a team where everybody works as if they're one. They're all working for the same thing. Everybody does what they're supposed to do. And we get into this world where it's me versus you. And uh, it, this shows this oneness idea that, that a team that works together can beat a team with all the superstars any day of the week. Because yeah. superstars are playing their own little game. They don't play together and stuff. So yeah, there's spiritual lessons, I think, in everything. And I'm, and and mm -hmm. when you have the sport thing, you, you start looking at it. And that's what I, you know, I thought it was just sports too. And then you start seeing these spiritual analogies to what goes on in sports. And it's uh, kind of interesting. So. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that. I, um, uh, I'm good friends with, um, I mentioned him in some of my books by a man named George Mumford, who, you know, brought mindfulness. Um, he was like Phil Jackson's, you know, secret weapon for the Chicago Bulls and Los Angeles Lakers, but he brought a lot of, you know, mindfulness teachings. He was actually Julius Irving's Dr. J's roo uh, um, roommate and teammate at the University of Massachusetts. And he wow. really, um, you know, got educated by Dr. You know, John Kabat-Zinn, you know, with this stuff. But um, it's funny, like early on, Michael Jordan was, you know, I think Phil was trying to teach him some of these concepts or might have been Kobe, but he said, there's no I in team, but he goes, yeah, but there is an I in win. But eventually you're right for, you know, if you look at, for instance, old Yankee teams prior to them spending all that money, yeah. they were a team. And it's once they got all these, you know, isolated agents that they stopped winning. And so you could be as talented as anything, but if you don't have that cohesion, everyone having each other's backs, you're going to be limited with your success, much like anything else. There's strength in numbers and strength in cohesion. And that's just a microcosm of the human race. Yeah, We could just be as ind great individual isolated agents. But if we're not working together, if we're not seeing that we're all on the same team, yeah, we're not going to be victorious. You know? Yeah, And, even, and even with the losses or the people who sort of get lost, you, you still have the thing that in the end, it's all going to be okay everybody's going to find their way to the, to the, to the Eventually, light. Yeah. Anyway, it's just a, it's just a game anyway. I mean, it's like, you know, and all you can do is really take care of yourself. You can't really save anybody else. You, I, you and I came here for, uh, you know, on purpose, we probably came here for a reason. When we leave, they're going to ask you how to work out because you planned it. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is worry about why did I come into the world and what am I supposed to be doing here? And, and am I doing it? And that's it. All right. Right. Yeah, that's. And, and is there anything we've we've not talked about that you think is an important message to get out there? Last one: the being while we are doing. Yeah, you know, okay. so many of us see ourselves as you know just doers, but we're human beings, and wow. just remember when we do, we need to be, you know, just being present while we are doing. Because if we are doing without being, we're living a very empty life. We're just chasing. So, yeah, again. Wow. It's that that presence. Uh, but Grant, thank you so much. And hopefully we could have another one of these yeah. conversations with the wisdom of Jacob's ladder coming out. Yeah, of a couple I'd like of to do it. When, when the book comes out, send me a, an email. And uh, again, just give me two times. I'll pick one of the times and and we'll go from there. And it sounds like you you're you're busy and you've got uh, it's working out for you. You're a spiritual you're a, 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 a fountain of spiritual wisdom. And I have learned a lot from you today and i appreciate having the conversation let's uh stay in touch and and uh follow i'll follow what you're doing and uh i'll try to promote you as much as i can and i i think you're um a, a gift to the world so thank you the feeling is completely mutual and then some my brother thank you grant okay uh, you have a good day you too okay. Okay.